encountered Sarah Rule's play uh, Eurydice from two trusted sources. One was Andre Bishop, the artistic director of Lincoln Center Theater, and the other was my younger sister, Christine, who is much more savvy about contemporary American theater than I am. I was meeting with Andre and Peter Gelb uh, about the new piece, and I said I was attracted to reimagining the Orpheus story uh, for our world, and, and the next words out of Andre's mouth were Sarah Rule. So I asked my, my sister if, if, if that was a good idea, and she looked at me like I was crazy for having to ask. I was always fascinated by the Orpheus and Eurydice myth, and I always wondered what would happen if Eurydice had more subjectivity, more point of view, more agency. And I imagine the moment where Orpheus turns, and I imagine the moment before Eurydice saying his name and startling him and that causing him to turn. So that was the seed of it. On a more personal level, my father, who I was really close to, died when I was 20. And I think I just wanted to have more conversations with him. And I thought, well, if Eurydice's in the underworld, it stands to reason she would meet an ancestor and she meets her father and relearns her life. And I think that's really the emotional kernel of why I wrote the play. What moves us about Eurydice always, I think, is it's about that moment of life of the near miss and the irretrievable loss and how time only moves in one direction. And to me, it, it always feels like that moment in childhood, which I think has happened to everyone, where you let go of the balloon and you, you don't understand that it can't come back. The story in this opera is really the story of a young woman, Eurydice. I think of her as a college student. She's quite young, really smart, a little bit insecure. Her mind is ahead of her other instincts in a certain way. It's the story of her self-realization and self-actualization. Mary Zimmerman has a long history with this story and with myths in general. Of course, her production of Metamorphoses, her adaptation was such an important show for New York in the wake of 9-11. And there's a beautiful kind of full circle quality um, to our collaboration because Sarah Rule saw Mary's Metamorphoses before she wrote Eurydice and was partially inspired to write the play based on Mary's take on the myth. I saw Mary's Metamorphosis in Chicago, where I'm from originally, when I was pretty young, and I think it made a big impression on me. So Mary's visual style was always something I found quite beautiful and probably influenced my work in general because I think as a director, she's able to marry classical language to image in a stunning way. The chief challenge uh, in terms of visually conceiving Eurydice is what does the underworld look like? And I think I and my team felt a particular responsibility, given that this is a world premiere, to be pretty straightforward with our conception of the underworld. When you're a director of a, a world premiere, visually, you should play the melody. You should not yet play a variation. There's too much going on for the audience just apprehending the music for the very first time in their lives. Sometimes as a director, you're an architect and sometimes you're a carpenter. And here I'm a little bit more of a carpenter. I just wanted to be straightforward. So if it's set a beach, it's a beach. It's set in a kind of contemporary world, a contemporary language and environment. Although she has these stage directions about at times, Eurydice is dressed in 30s garb, and I think at times in 50s. So it's contemporary, but not super specified. It's sort of always and ever now. I sometimes think of my music as being uh, explosively tonal, in the sense that I work with materials that might sound familiar, you know, a chord you've heard before, or a gesture you've heard before, but I tend to take them to extremes to make them behave in ways that maybe they haven't ever before. And my influences are from all over the place, from Verdi to Alban Berg to Duke Ellington to Radiohead. What is the highest note you sing in this opera? Oh, in this opera, oh, it's actually not, not that high. I think we get to a D. Yeah, a D. For me, I guess. but appropriately high for the moments. I think that's what's critical when you're, when you're talking about these things is that everything has to be uh, dramatically motivated. 
Orpheus has a divided nature. He's part human and part something else. There's a lot of disagreement about whether he's mortal or whether his father was the god Apollo. Um, so he has this mortal side and this kind of divine side. So I thought, let's musicalize that. Um, and the way I did it was to have two singers play Orpheus. The baritone, sung by Joshua Hopkins, is kind of Orpheus the mortal, the regular guy. I figured the baritone is kind of the normal dude of voice types. But when he goes into one of his musical trances, there's kind of an overtone or an echo, which is the countertenor, which is the highest of male voice types. It sits in the falsetto register. The big change was having a double for Orpheus. And that was really a musical consideration because Matt wanted an unearthly sound. In a way, it's the same question I was asking, how do you get this sublime quality of Orphic music? And Matt always heard it that way, which I think is really smart. It gives him a bit of androgyny and a bit of otherworldliness and a bit of incandescence. We've all been Orpheus at the moment of the backward look. It captures something so essential in the human psyche. Um, it's the act of doing the thing that you know will hurt you, that you know will, will, will be bad for you, and yet you do it. You do it with the full knowledge of its disastrousness. The play turned opera is about grief, collective grief and loss. And so I hope it gives people a place to mourn for you know the, this time we've been away from each other and whatever losses people have had during COVID, which are, are probably legion. Coming back, doing Eurydice at the end of the pandemic, it's almost like Eurydice with a happy ending, right? In this case, you get to look, and that is the reward. Looking back, being face to face is the prize. <laughs>